Hey guys, this is Josh Townsend with Legacy 5. We are so excited about being here with you this morning. Um, I'm especially excited about being here because I get to see all of my Northwoods family and friends that I don't get to see very often. Um, I hope all of you had a great 4th of July yesterday filled with your friends and family. Uh, if you're watching online, uh, whether it be on the Northwoods website or on Facebook or Twitter or any of those things, please say hi in the comments because we want to hear from you. Um, also, share it on your personal pages. Guys, I am so excited about being here. But I am so excited because Northwoods starts right now. could be found. I sought for meaning in the words of great men, but all the words just let me down. Not seeking justice for the things that I've done, my soul needed mercy and I found it in God's Broke open alabaster to anoint 
the master If he was truly God Why couldn't he see She was a sinner She was a sinner But he defended her With nothing but Along with her past A sweet fragrance of repentance The room filled with forgiveness She finally found the kind of love That will last now and forever And I've heard philosophies People have opinions In their own point of view I've heard preachers preach And I've heard teachers teach But it all comes down to The simple gospel truth believes in the Word of God, let me hear you say amen. Amen. The skeptic only finds ancient words from ancient times, and they're quick to tell you that it's all out of date. Oh, but I see a timeless truth, and my life is living proof. Of its power to save And I'm not ashamed to say I believe the book Every story that I've heard Every line and every word In those sacred pages I believe it's true Written down for me and you And it stood the test of time Ages. 
if you believe the book, then you know that one day you're going to see him face to face. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Think about your best day ever, the one you wish would last forever. It was such a wow. Yes, it was. Blue skies and perfect weather. You didn't think it could get better, but the sun went down. Yeah, the sun went down. But you didn't want to see it go. All the fun will never last, you know. But what if it could? That would be good. What a day, one day, someday it's gonna be. When we all are finally free, Earth has passed. Oh, what a day, one day, someday it's gonna be. When the Father welcomes me home at last. Oh, I close my eyes and I can see it. It's far away, but I believe it. It's a dream that's real. No more night and no more sorrow No more pain and no tomorrow Wonder how that feels How will it feel? What a day, one day, some day's gonna be When we all are finally free Earth has passed Oh, what a day, one day, some day's gonna be When the Father welcomes me home at Last service, they got me. I thought they had ended the song, and I came all the way up here, and then they had to end it three more times. <laughs> now I came up at the right time. That's good. We're glad to have you guys here. You're like family. Love you guys. It's awesome. Well, Northwoods, 
Glad you've joined us as well. You can go ahead and take your seats. Happy 4th of July weekend to everyone. And Legacy 5 actually has a little something special in honor of this weekend. But before we enjoy that, I got a few important things for you. First, if you've been with us, you know that we're currently in a series called Wide Awake. And personally, this is, I think, my favorite series of this year because I really believe that it's incredibly powerful when the people of God begin to get wide awake to all that Jesus is doing and saying in their days. So this is an important series for us as a church. And next weekend, our Chillicothe campus pastor, Keith Lindgren, is going to talk to us about humbling ourselves before God. And if you don't think you need to hear a message on humility, well, that's the sure sign you need to hear that message. So please show up next weekend. Don't forget to RSVP. You can do that right within the Northwoods app. Now, normally I would stop here in announcements and I would invite the ushers forward to pass the offering bags, but because of this little thing called a global pandemic, we're not doing that anymore. We're not passing the offering bags for our safety and yours. Instead of doing that, we've put some offering boxes all around the building at various places. So if you'd like to give, you can drop your giving off at those boxes. Of course, you can continue to give online if you want, and you can also give within the Northwoods app. And while we're here, I want to just say again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to every single one of you who gives all the time, continuously, sacrificially, because the ministry that happens here only happens because of your giving. And speaking of ministries that are happening here, I'm excited to announce to you guys that this is the first weekend now that all of our next-gen ministries are officially up and running, open. All the parents said amen. Don't got to have my children in here with me. But really, Discoveryland, Quest, Converge, it's all open, all open. We have ministries for your child, for your student to come and encounter Jesus. And Maybe a physical gathering for your child or your student is something that you're not comfortable with yet. That's okay, because Discoveryland and Quest are going to be continuing to put out online content throughout the week. If you need or want more information about that, it's real easy. You just go to northwoods.church slash nextgen. Now, on top of that, we've also started up our prayer and deliverance appointments again. So if you've been waiting to make a prayer appointment a deliverance session, you can go online, you can sign up and you can get more info. Again, it's just an easy URL, northwoods.church slash prayer. Now, last thing for you is this. Our missions teams here at Northwoods, they're always going above and beyond, but they've been working especially hard in this season to prepare trips for late 2020 and early 2021 so that we can go out and we can serve our partners all around the globe. And so this upcoming weekend, our missions uh, team is hosting an info meeting and a bunch of the leaders for these upcoming trips are going to be there at that meeting. So if you've been on a mission trip, if you've never been on a mission trip, you want to be there. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to be inspired by the stories that they share of what God is doing across the world. And if you've got questions, they are the ones to answer those for you. Again, it's just a simple URL. If you want more information, you go to northwoods.church slash missions, all right? That's all I've got for you today. So with that being said, take it away. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd worked for all my life And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I'd thank my God above To be living here today Because the flag, it still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American Yeah. 
guys, we are no more special to God than anyone else. But aren't you thankful that you get to live here? Yeah. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston, and New York to L.A. Well, there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say, that I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the man who died, who gave that right to me, and I'll gladly stand up next to you. Defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA And I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me Is that good, guys? Come on, give it up one more time for our friends. Legacy Five, so good to have them with us today. I said they, they, they got to feel like a horse waiting at the gate, ready to run. All these gospel groups, you know, they, you talk about people being out of work. And so we, we had them here uh, scheduled to be here for this weekend for probably a year now. And uh, we thought, you know what? We're back meeting. We're trying to social distance, be as careful as we can. But let's, let's, keep, let's do a special 4th of July weekend and keep it on the docket. So they're going to be here tonight at 6 o'clock. It's only 10 bucks a ticket. Let's uh, fill the place up with all the appropriate social distancing, and, and we'll just have us a grand old time, okay? I hope many of you will come out for that tonight. Um, again, we're in a new series called Wide Awake on God's call to wake up uh, and guard against spiritual lethargy in our lives. It's possible for us as believers to be asleep. And when he says wake up, I mentioned last week that doesn't necessarily mean don't fall asleep on the preacher, though that's probably not a good idea either. I'll call on you, you know? Now, if any of you start struggling today, you just do this. This is Mr. Bean trying to stay awake in church. And uh, if I see that anywhere, I'll know you're trying to let, hey, land the plane, Cal. It's time, it's time to go. But see, sleep in its proper context is a good thing. You know, getting a good night's, night's rest is critical to our overall well-being. If you good, got a good night's rest last night, you probably aren't in danger of falling asleep right now. So we've got to sleep in the right places. But, you know... It's sleep in the, the wrong context. That's not a good thing. And the more ser serious problem is that the one who's asleep is oblivious to, fact, to the fact that they are, right? You don't know it when you're truly asleep. Everybody else around you may know it, but you don't know it. And uh, that's when it can become a dangerous thing. I remember as a junior in high school, waiting, I believe it was like my two o'clock class, and we were at the door waiting to go in, and the teacher came out, and he said, hey guys, the class before you is going to tiptoe out, I want you to tiptoe in because there's a guy sleeping, and we're just going to see how long it'll be until he wakes up. So sure enough, we got in there, and Gene from the class before us just got his head down on the desk, he's, he's asleep. Of course, we didn't hear anything that day, we're all focused on Gene. When's this guy going to wake up? And it's like, halfway through our class when he finally stirs 
kind of comes to and notices that everybody's looking at him and also notices that this is not the class that I came into. And our teacher goes, good afternoon, Gene. Glad you could join us, you know. So not only was it really embarrassing for him, but like I said last week, part of what happens when we fall asleep, now we're not where we need to be at the time we need to be. He's missing his next class, see, because he's sleeping through. And so that's kind of the the whole point. When we're not where we need to be, when we need to be, we're missing out on what should be happening in our lives, and that's what can happen to us spiritually. So last week as we began this series, I talked about the fact that God's wake-up call is always directed at the church or the people of God. It's not really, we we talk about revival uh, or waking up. It's not an evangelistic crusade. He's going, no, I want to get my people awake, and when my people are awake, then I'll use them to wake up people next to them. See? And so it's always about the people of God coming alive. And I also said, well, it's not our job to initiate revival. There is something of a sovereign component to where God pours out renewal and revival, but that doesn't mean there's nothing we can do. So as as I said last week in this series, um, I talked about the fact that we can position ourselves to receive what God wants to pour out, just as that receiver in football, if he's going to catch the pass, he goes to where the quarterback said, and the pass will land there, right? So we position ourselves, and the text that we're using, it's foundational to this series, is Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name, so you see it's, it's my people, this is where God's wanting to send renewal. My people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. And so we looked at the four moves that are critical in positioning ourselves to receive God's outpouring. There's a humility move. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. And so again, all the, the next four weeks are going to be unpacking these words. First move is the humility move. Second move is the dependency move. If they'll humble themselves and pray. That's the dependency move. Then the third move is the intimacy move. Seek my face. And the fourth move is turn from your wicked ways. We call that the fidelity move. And as I said, again, next four weeks, we're going to kind of land on each one of those particular words or movement. Now, today, from a different text... I want to look at the five phases of awakening that God wants to bring to your life. If you're a follower of Jesus, he wants to awaken you further. And you may, you may say, I, I feel like I've experienced that one, but not that one. Not, you know, so these are awakenings he wants to bring to your life. If you're not a follower of Jesus, these are awakenings he wants to bring to your life. And we need these awakenings. These are all portrayed in the uh, life of Jacob. And we're going to start in Genesis 28 as he's running away from home. He's on the run because his brother Esau, twin brother, is absolutely ticked off. So much so that he wants to kill Jacob. That's, he, that's being pretty mad. Jacob hears about it and says, I better hightail it. And why is it? Jacob means deceiver. He slimed his brother out of his rightful inheritance, the blessing as the firstborn. Jacob's running is now like an admission of guilt. He knows he's done wrong by way of his brother. And so he takes off from Beersheba and heads to his mother's family in Haran, a distance of about 500 miles. We're going to put this up so you can see. He's got a long way to go. And remember, they don't have cars in those days. He's on foot, and depending on the terrain, he's going to be able to move about 20 miles a day. So he's going to be on the road for 25 days until he gets to Herod. About four days into his journey, 80 miles in, uh, we encounter, he has a, an amazing thing happen that, that just changes his life. He has no idea that awesome is about to happen. Again, I, I think the feeling that Jacob has here is he, he knows he's a rascal. He deserves to be on the run. He probably doesn't think about God much, but when he does, um, he likely feels about himself that I'm not the kind of person that God really wants to hang out with. And so what happens here, 
in chapter 28 is all the more startling. Let's read it. Uh, Genesis 28, I'm going to read from 11 to 15. So he's on the run. It says, when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Now, they didn't have my pillow in his day. But boy, I mean, what, dude, you could find better than a rock. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. The, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. By the way, offspring is singular, pointing to the Messiah who's going to come, and the entire earth is going to be blessed through your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Wow, an amazing encounter for a guy who's not even sure God likes him, huh? So look at his response in verse 16. I love this. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought... Surely the Lord is in this place because I've just met him and I was not aware of it. That's us until God wakes us up. We're just like sleepwalking, meandering our way through life, not really aware of him at all until out of nowhere we have a God encounter that takes our breath away and suddenly everything's different. We say with Jacob in verse 17, how awesome is this place? We're like, oh my gosh. God was here all along and I didn't realize it. Oh my gosh, he, he knows my name. And I didn't realize it. Oh my gosh, he, he does care about me. He, he does even like me. Uh, he loves me and he has a purpose for me. And man, when that breaks into our lives in intimate encounter, it does take our breath away. This, that becomes an awesome place where we realize that. And that, that is phase one. That's where awakening begins. Phase one is what I call the presence awakening. The presence awakening refers to those places in our lives where we encountered God in a fresh way and we became aware that he is real, that he's with us, and that he has a plan for our lives. And for many of us, that undoubtedly would include our conversion experience, we call it, where we came to know Jesus and we went from darkness to light and we became a part of his kingdom. We realize that, man, he loves us. And yes, he died on a cross for our sin and he, he rose from the grave and, 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 and now he's calling us to himself. And we, we feel, I don't know how it happened for you, but you felt strangely drawn to him and it became your personal conversion experience. You knew God had spoken to you and it woke you up. Always be a blessed time. I, that happened for me in fourth grade, I brought along the picture. One of my sons had that frame for me, but just kind of look in the middle of that lawn right there, kind of where the grass is messed up. That's probably where I was, fourth grade art class, when something overwhelmed me and I knew enough about Jesus that I wanted to invite him into my heart. Happened right there. How awesome is that place? See, I never, I never drive by that place, but I think of the encounter that happened for me as a 10-year-old when I knew that I knew that I knew that God knew me and he was now in my life, right? Now, listen, that wasn't my first encounter with him. I, I just knew enough now to invite him in my life. Guys, I can remember when I was four years old. I have memories that all go all the way back to thir three years old. Four years old, I'm about that high. I'm wearing my saddle shoes at church. And when it was time to pray, God, Dad would stand me up on the back of the pew so I could have my arm up around him. And I would stand there praying. And all I can tell you, I remember a night where the awe of God, all I could say, I was like, wow, he's here and he's real. 
and you don't play with him. I was four years old. I had my spiritual awakening to Jesus, fourth grade, 17. I'm wondering what to do with my life when I go to college. Walking into church that morning, I've spoken to you about this many, many times. That Sunday morning, God, what do you, you know, that's the prayer of my heart. What do, you, what do you want me to do when I graduate? And I hear the audible voice of God that morning calling me to preach the gospel. I've got a picture of that place too. How awesome is that place? I walked out of there that day going, Oh, how awesome is that place? Because every place that you meet him becomes a really awesome place. That's why I still remember a particular Sunday, February 2nd, 1986, at the church I was pastoring in Grable, Indiana. Our first uh, child, Catherine, had been born on the previous Wednesday, January 29th. I had brought Susan and Catherine home from the hospital on Saturday, February 1st, since Susan had experienced a few complications following Catherine's birth. Plus, she'd just given birth to a 10-pounder, right? She was like, you just go ahead and go to church today. I think I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> you know? And, and uh, you know, in, the, in our tradition, we had... Sunday school class before the worship service, and I'm sitting in Sunday school class. We'd always open the class with, um, you know, what, what were some of the highlights of the week? And of course, everybody knows we've got our first daughter. That was a highlight, but guys, I will never forget what happened that Sunday as a young, a young gal, she's a good friend of ours, uh, named Joanne Short, shared of how as she was on her way to work on Wednesday morning, Precisely at the time when my wife was in labor with Catherine, and she didn't, Joanne didn't know this, but the Lord spoke to her as she was driving and said, pull over right now and pray for Cal and Susan. I don't, I don't know if there was something that God knew we needed special prayer for. I, I, I don't know what that was all about. Again, Joanne had no idea that we were currently at the hospital, that Susan was in labor. When God said, pull over and pray now, she responded to the Lord and said, well, Lord, I'm only like five minutes away from the office. I could just pull in the parking lot there at the office and I'll pray then. He said, no, I want you to pull over right here and stop now and pray. So there she is alongside the road, praying for us while our daughter's being born. I don't even know how to describe to you what happened in my heart as she shared that story that day. All I can tell you is that the awe of God gripped my soul and nearly took my breath away. Tears just immediately began down my face as the awareness broke over me that he knows my name. If in fact he can speak to somebody about me and my wife personally and have them sitting alongside a road praying for us by name because he said pray for Cal and Susan. No, he knows my name. He knows the intimate details about my life so much so that he would have someone parked alongside a road praying for us at the moment of our daughter's birth. And in that moment that day, a Sunday school room was transformed from an ordinary block classroom to an awesome place of encounter with the presence of God as a heavenly reality came crashing into my earthly realm and awakened me afresh to God's personal knowledge of and care for me. That's what happens with the presence awakening. We become aware of him and his awareness of us in a new way. And it changes everything. His presence begins to inform and infuse our every waking moment. The great poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning was writing of the presence awakening. It's one of my favorite poems. She penned, earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. Get what she's saying? Only the one that's awake recognizes the presence. Only he who sees takes off his shoes. The, the, the rest sit around and pluck back blackberries. 
You know what she's saying? Some, some are just, they're so, they, they, they don't know God's there. They're just, they're just going about their business. We're just plucking blackberries. But the person who sees is like, oh, 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 this, 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 this is an awesome place. God, God's here. It's the presence of awakening. We, we recognize he's here. He's with me. How awesome is this place? And that usually leads to the next two rapid fire awakenings in no particular order, but it, it kind of is like this, the presence awakening and then the identity awakening. Here it goes from an encounter with God's presence in a particular place to the amazing reality that I can be a carrier of his presence in any place. That my life can actually be a touch point where the realities of heaven can now intersect earth. How awesome is that? So with the presence awakening breaking in on Jacob, he quickly experiences an identity awakening and he says in verse 17, how awesome is, is this place? This is none other than the house of God. Bethel. This is the gate of heaven. Now understand that the house of God and the gate of heaven are the same thing. They're simply referring to two different facets of the same reality. But hopefully a fresh breathtaking awareness is beginning to grip your soul with the realization that the house of God, this gate of heaven on earth is us. This is an Old Testament saint speaking a New Testament reality that God is not looking for a place. He is looking for a person. Can I hear an amen to that? Because I'm telling you what, you start waking up, you start, God, can I be that person? We, the church, individually and corporately, are a temple of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Apostle Paul says to the church collectively, don't you, plural, know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6.19, he says to the individual believer, don't you, singular, know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God. And why has God made us his temple? Is it just so we can sit around and experience thrills and chills? Why did he make us carriers of his presence? Listen, guys, God dwells in you so that you might serve as a touch point on earth, a temple in which he dwells, and a gate through which angels ascend and descend to impact earth with heaven's realities and hopefully wake up other sleepers around you. That's why he says, church, I need you awake. You say, surely you don't mean me. And my answer is, yes, I mean you. You might want to write this down because it's awesome when it, you get it. God designed your life for awesome. That you might be, it doesn't get any more awesome than this, that you might be a touch point on earth through which heavenly realities are released. It's what he made you for. As his temple, you are a gateway for God. A gate is a place of transition and access. You might walk through a gate on the way from your front yard to the sidewalk or from your backyard to your driveway. The gate says you are now leaving one place, transition, to access another, perhaps a more preferred place. When I go to Lambeau Field, to watch the Packers. I took Legacy 5 with me a couple of years ago. We had a great time up there. But you see, I know when I'm leaving the parking lot and I've entered the stadium because I've passed through the gates. 
And due to that transition, I now have access to the game, which totally transforms my experience from that of a mere bystander or tailgater outside the experience, plucking blackberries, as it were, to someone inside who's experiencing the awesomeness of that game, see? After this encounter, Jacob marks that place with a stone and he calls it Bethel, the house of God, as a memorial to the fact that this is where he first encountered God, just as I have special pictures of places where I encountered God. But Jacob was not saying this place, this spot of dirt where I was sleeping, this spot of earth where I met Jesus is the house of God, it's the gate of heaven. See, if that were the case, if it were limited to that spot where I met him, then the only way other people can come experience him is if I can bring you back to this spot and just kind of hope maybe they'll have something of the experience I had. No, when God wants to release a heavenly reality on earth, when he wants to release his love, his power, his goodness, he needs a touch point. He needs a gate through which to enter. And he does that through those who are now his temple. He is not looking for a place. He's looking for a person. You ready to be that person? His word to every follower of Jesus is, you are that touch point. You are that gate. You are that corporately when you are gathered. God says, Northwoods, I want your weekly gatherings to be a place where the goodness of heaven is displayed and people regularly encounter my love, my forgiveness, my grace, my presence, my power, and they leave saying, how awesome was that place today? Why? Because God was here. But he also says to each of us, remember, when you leave the church building, I'm not looking for a place, I'm looking for a person. And wherever you go throughout the week, at work, in your home, in your neighborhood, in the gym, you are our gate by which I want to access people who need to experience my awesome goodness, love, grace, and power. You're a touch point on earth for heaven's sake to release awesome. Oh, when we become aware of this awesome reality, a third awakening quickly transpires, the presence awakening, the quick, quickly after that, the identity awakening. Oh, he's not, it's not a place. It's, holy cow, I've experienced his presence, and now I'm becoming a carrier of that presence wherever I go. It leads to a third phase, which is what I call the opportunity awakening. The opportunity awakening. This is where I become aware that if I am a carrier of the presence of God, if I am a temple of the living God and a gateway for his presence to intersect earth, then anywhere I go presents opportunity for others to encounter him. Church, are we awake? This is why the Apostle Paul's wake-up calls to the church. He said in Ephesians 5, 16, make the most of every opportunity. And he might have added, realize every moment is an opportunity. See, as carriers of God's presence, we just need to be awake and alert to how God wants to use the moment. I was sitting in a Starbucks a couple years ago meeting with a friend and a young lady who was a student at Bradley. I later learned, saw my iPhone with its Packer cover sitting there on the table. It just means God, but you know, she thought it meant Green Bay. And so she said, she said uh, who, whose phone is that? And when I mentioned it was mine, she said, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. I'm a huge Packer fan, but I can't find a lot of them around here. And I told her about my Packer shrine at home, that I was fan enough to count for 20 people, et cetera. And meanwhile, listening in on our conversation that day was another young lady. When this gal asked me what I do, I, and I told her I was a pastor out at Northwoods, this lady jumped in with both feet, just a young gal. And she said, I drive over an hour to get to Northwoods each weekend. I love it. Then she just began to tell this gal that she should come sometime. And by the time we were done, that young Bradley student had gone online, looked up the church, asked about our times, and said, I'm coming this weekend. 
And I thought, what just happened there is what we're talking about. Just through a chance encounter at Starbucks around a Packer iPhone, nonetheless, a young lady who was excited about a relationship with God became a critical touch point for another young lady who moments before wasn't even thinking about her connection with God and transition happened right there in Starbucks around, I thought I was coming for a coffee, but now all of a sudden we're talking God and I'm wanting to come to church. You see, it all happened because he found a gate through which he could enter and transform that experience. Guys, write this one down. Awesome happens whenever a heavenly reality intersects with our earthly realm. That's, that's awesome. And here's what's awesome for us. We get to be the connectors We get to connect people to God's truth, his goodness, his love, his power, his grace. I, I, don't, I don't know what you're living for right now, but until you wake up to that, you go, holy cow, what could be greater than that? We have only to get good at asking a couple of strategic questions every day and everywhere we go. These, these are our questions that people who have awakened ask. One, Lord, where are you at work today and how can I join you? What's on your agenda? Because I want to do that. Two, as you are encountering people, you want to ask the Lord, Lord, what did you have in mind for that person when you created them? And is there any special word you have for them today? He, he, he just looks for people who are awake to that and then he begins to deliver things. And all of a sudden you find that you can be speaking into somebody's life and, and all of a sudden the truth of God is coming awake in them in ways that they never... Because you, you, you've been the transition. There, 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 something of heaven is coming in now. Because you're awake. One pastor who lives this reality about as well as anyone I know was in Hawaii in 2012. And looking for a sandwich shop late one night, kind of got lost and ended up in a rather seedy area. A wannabe pimp offered him some drugs and then offered him a girl who looked to be about 15. He got angry that the devil was trying to swallow this gal's life at such a young age, but being aware of his identity and his opportunity and who he is and that where I am, the presence of God wants to intersect with our earth. He walked over to her, found out that her name was Kayla. And he said, Kayla, What's your dream for your life? Because he knew it wasn't this. She was like, I don't have a dream. He said, well, I'm a pastor and God talks to me about his dreams for other people all the time. So let's pray for a minute and just ask God to show you a dream for your life. So he leads her in a prayer. Jesus, you love me and created me to enjoy life in its fullness. Show me something I was created for. All of a sudden she went, whoa. Whoa. Now, people's eyes around her were getting really big. And, he, and this pastor said, what did, what did he tell you? What did he show you? She said, I heard I should be a cook. Which resonated with something deep in her heart. So he says, well, God doesn't give us a dream without helping us know the steps to take. So let's ask him for some steps. So they prayed, Lord, what is the step I can take this week toward the dream you have for me? And again, she goes, whoa, and I'm stopping here going, here's a 15-year-old that's living on the street. Do you guys know that where God can find a person who hasn't been theologized away from the fact that he still speaks, that they, they pick it up pretty quick? It's only in the church where you're taught that God doesn't speak like that anymore, right? That you just have a hard time hearing him. Man, I'll tell you what. You just let God meet people where they are and they'll have awesome encounters and that is what happened to her. She goes, whoa! And he's like, what did he, what, what did, what did he tell you? He said, God said to call my uncle who owns a diner. I never talk to him because my mom hates him and never lets us talk to him or see him. 
So the pastor made her promise that she would call her uncle the next day and let him know what happened. And long story short, this, this uncle asked her to come because they wanted to hire her. They ended up bringing her out to live with them. Both of them were walking with Jesus and had been praying for her regularly. By the time she, see this happened uh, one night when she was 15. By the time she was 17, she was walking with Jesus. She had finished school early with a full high school degree. She was managing the diner and the uncle was taking her on as a co-owner of another location. And it all happened because God found a gate on earth one night through whom he could release the reality of heaven and call a young wayward runaway girl into the truth of her destiny. How how awesome is that? And I know this. As you're sitting here today, if you're a follower of Jesus, and maybe even if you're not, there's something in you that God is awakening. And you're not even sure that this could be for me. Maybe for special pastors. I'm telling you. You give God full and complete access and control of your life, and I'm telling you, this is what He wants for you. And there's something deep within you going, that's what I want. That's what I want. I want to be that person. I want that to be normal for me. That's why he sends the presence, identity, opportunity, awakening. Now, now there's a fourth. Because you're going you're, you're to find out that when you start allowing God to use you and he starts making you that connector and, and, and you have these awesome encounters, that stuff's like addictive. And, and it subtly can become about us. We, we become the authorities. We become, oh, look, look at me. Huh? Man, look at what God's doing. Oh, boy. And, and, and hey, listen, he wants, to, he wants to impact people through your life, and it is awesome. That's why he's got to bring you to this fourth awakening. I call it the sensitivity awakening. This awakening comes when we realize that we were made for being that touch point in the earth, and as such, we don't want anything to in any way hinder the work of God that he wants to do in and through us or to bring reproach to his name. This is why the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 4 and verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God starts saying, yes, I want to use you, but I want to clean you up as well, and I want to get idols out of your life, and I don't want this to be about you anymore. As carriers of the presence of God through the person of the Holy Spirit, we need to recognize that his first name is holy and he loves to operate in that environment. If we give him something other than that while we're carriers of his presence, then his presence is going to be limited. Not because he's limited, but because he can't get through. I have a book on my shelf by a guy I, I read about every book he puts out, but this one was just called Pigeon Religion. And it was to talk about the fact that oftentimes saints of God are, are not quick to discern the difference between what's false and what's true. And so if I had here on the stage today a white pigeon and a white dove, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference because pigeons and doves look just about alike. But if you watch their behavior, they're nothing alike. This is why the dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. That dove can't stand noise. He can't stand dirt. He can't stand filth. His mating habits, one person, one, one other dove for life, that's it. Faithfulness, loyalty, fidelity. It's so everything, that's why, that's the Holy Spirit of God. Pigeon, looks like a dove, loves dirt, loves noise, loves filth, will mate with anything it finds. And he explained the difference in that book to say this, as a follower of Jesus Christ and a carrier of the presence of Jesus, it would be good for you to get a picture of the fact that you have a little white dove right here on your shoulder. 
And again, my theology is not that once you have that dove, he can fly away and leave you. No, he's, he's there but he, he, because he wants to use you, wants to whisper in your ear and give you what you need to know for that day and in whatever encounter you're in. But here's the thing. If, if you're gonna live with noise and you're gonna live with dirt and you're gonna live with filth, that little dove will say, okay, okay, I'll just stay over here. You, you go ahead and do it your way. We can grieve him, we can quench him, we can resist him, and then wonder why if I'm supposed to be a connector, God doesn't use me all that much. I would say, well, how are you doing with the dove? Carrying him around with you? Sensitive to his every move? Sensitive to make sure there's nothing in my life that would cause him to just kind of want to fly off and just stay in another part of the room. Watch this, watch this phase of awakening in Jacob's life as he's now called back to this place in the land of promise. We don't get into our full promise, but by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And after he's been gone 20 years, God says, okay, now it's time. I'm taking you back in your land of promise. Turn to 35, chapter, chapter 35 and verse one quickly. God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel. That's the place of encounter. I'm gonna take you back to that place of encounter and, and settle there and build an altar there to the Lord who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. Now, now watch this. Without any prompting, but having advanced in his journey with God and knowing that he doesn't want anything between him and God, you know, he now prepares to dwell in his land of promise. He says to his household in verse two, said to his household and to all who are with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you, purify yourselves and change your clothes. This is the, the sensitivity awakening and it will take you into a fresh release of God's promise and purposes for you. And that, that, that changing of the clothes, that's like, you know, Lord, put, I just want the character of the Holy Spirit. to. I want to be dressed up with your character. So with this awakening, we are praying with Jacob, God, I've experienced so much of your work and your goodness and your faithfulness. And since you have created me to be a touch point, a gate and a temple for you, I don't want to allow any compromise in my life. So Lord, I surrender every idol. If there's anything in my life that is hindering your work, please remove it from my life. Lord, if there's anything in my life from which I need to be purified, oh God, cleanse me afresh, heal me, free me from that sin. And Lord, release the fruit of the Holy Spirit in me so that all who see me, see not me, but they see the holy character of God working in me. Have you come to that place of desperate encounter? Oh, I so want to be awake to who I am in you, Lord, and to the opportunities you've given me. I want nothing, nothing, nothing between us, nothing hindering. <sighs> holy Spirit will meet you there. And he brings us through all of those to finally awaken us to what I call this phase five, the supremacy awakening. Colossians 1.18 says it so well. And he, that is Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. If you're part of the church, he's the head in your life. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything, including your life, he might have the supremacy, protuon, preeminent, meaning he not only got first place, but there is no second, third, fourth. He is everything. Can I hear an amen in the house? Come on. This is the awakening that will take us into a new place with God. Does he have first place? Is he preeminent? Does he have supremacy in your life, in all things? There really is an amazing shift that takes place here in Jacob's life. It's a shift that God wants to ultimately awaken in each of our own lives. Jacob goes back to Bethel, and I want you to see this in Genesis 35, 6 here as we wrap this up. Really amazing. Where are we at? So some of you are like that, yeah, okay? 
I love this. They set out. I got to read five. They set out and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around. L listen to me. The terror of God is falling on other people. Why? Because they are now carriers of the presence of God. This is, they, they've been cleansed. They've buried their idol. There's a presence of God they're carrying. And people around are like, oh, something about them. Verse six, Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel. Remember where he'd been 20 years earlier? Town of Luz has that encounter, Beth El, Beth. Anytime you see Beth in the scriptures, that's house. Bethlehem, house of bread. Beth El, house of God. He came to Luz, that is Bethel in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar and he called the place Renames it, and it's significant. Significant shift in our lives when this happens. No longer Bethel, house of God. It's El Bethel. It's the God of the house of God. Nothing wrong with the name Bethel. House of God. But where is the emphasis in that name? Which part of that name has priority or supremacy? House which signifies my work, my name, my church, my impact. The emphasis is on what I've built or what I'm doing for God. Nothing wrong with wanting to have impact and build something for God. But what has the supremacy? He changes the name to El Bethel, the God of the house of Bethel. Where's the emphasis? It's now on the God of the house, not on the house itself. It's an amazing shift. And that change is significant. Author and pastor Deverne Fromke wrote years ago, many Christians never get beyond serving the cause, the project, the thing they are developing for God. God is in their thoughts, but he's not first. Somehow they're building the house of God, Bethel, and that's become first. He admits that he did that for years within his own church. And I admit from the perspective of nearly 40 years in ministry, I too, without knowing it at times, was preoccupied with the building, with building the house of God rather than with knowing the God of the house. Can subtly fall asleep. He goes on, we can judge our spiritual growth pretty accurately by observing the total emphasis of our heart gaze. What is my primary interest? Is it Bethel or El Bethel? Is it my service or my savior? Is it my labor or my Lord? Is it my ministry or my master? Is it my God or my church? He says, we are spiritual or carnal to the degree that we are preoccupied with the house or with the God of the house. Wow. A.B. Simpson's one of my favorite pastors from yesteryear. He was born in the mid-1800s, pastored till 1919. He was a firebrand for God. I read everything I can from A.B. A. B. Simpson. He wrote hymns and one of his or poems, one of his poems was made into a hymn. And I want to quote a, a, a couple of verses here and then add one of my own. And it, it, it signifies what we're talking about here, this switch from Bethel to El Bethel, that God, ultimately, I, I want my life just to be consumed for your glory alone. Listen, listen, listen to what he writes here. He says, once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, now it is his word. Once his gift I wanted, now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, now himself alone. Once it was my working, but his it hence shall be. I love this line. Once I tried to use him, now he uses me. Once the power I wanted, now the mighty one. Once for self I labored, now for him alone. I added this verse. Once I hungered for the praise, now it is his fame. Once I hoped they might know me, Now it is his name. 
Once it was my messages. Now it is all his story. Once it was my work for him. Now alone, his glory. Church, can you say that today? God, I just want it to be about you. Would you awaken me afresh to what you want to do in and through my life for your glory alone? Come on, let's stand. I want you just to, in this moment, recommit yourself to the God who has made you his temple. To the God who says, man, I want to use you as a gate, a place of transition, a connecting point on earth so that the realities I'm trying to send can, can get through. Would you let him know again today in this moment before you go, Lord, I can't, I can't think of anything else I want more than that. Everything else is just plucking blackberries. Any idols you need to give up? God, if there's anything in my life that I know is not pleasing to you, I surrender that. I I want to carry that heavenly dove in a way that he doesn't have to fly off and leave me because I'm quenching him and resisting him. And God, I just, I just want to be in that place. Holy, Holy Spirit, have your way in me. The old hymn said, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. That's what we're saying today. Can you tell him today, come now, Lord, and demonstrate through my life what can happen through a person who cares only for your glory and nothing else? Guys, he's looking not for a place, but for a person. And regardless of where you think you are in that context, Jacob was a rascal when God met him. He's just looking for a willing heart. Yeah, no one looking around. I'm not manipulating the moment, but I just believe there's something about response. If, if, if God's saying, I'm looking for a person, would you raise your hand to him in a way of surrender today? Say, God, God, I, I want to be that person. And let him know in your heart, Father, awaken me afresh till every ounce of my life is consumed with your glory alone and I'll give you all the praise in Jesus mighty name and everyone agreed with this prayer and said man come on can you give God praise let him know Lord I I want you you know if this was just an old fashioned church and we're not necessarily old fashioned but I, you know what I, I just decided today if some of you just feel like you know what I've been spoken to I, I feel like this is a, a moment for me uh, then you know as people are slipping out today and heading out just come and kneel at the steps kneel here make it the altar of a place of you know what I just I've just kind of had fresh encounter with God and I want to mark the moment this is a time of awakening for us so God bless you guys have a have a great week. I'm not going to see you for a couple of weeks, but you're going to continue to enjoy this series, I guarantee you. But God bless you guys. And again, thanks for being here today.